Good morning, good morning, and welcome to RCN Ministries Global TV. I am Apostle Rosemary. This is my awesome husband, Apostle Herbie. We are glad to be with you again on today to bring forth a rhema word from God. Today's message will be, don't let your comfort zone become your crypt. That is correct. Don't let your comfort zone become your crypt. We're going to hand it over to our Apostle Herbie, and um, we're going to allow him to just come in and to just open us up in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity once again. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this great woman of God I'm beside me, God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything you do in our life, what you do about you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we repent our sins, God. Forgive us, God, Jesus. God, we surrender everything to you, God, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we open the window of heaven and pour up this each and every one of us, God. Heavenly Father, we say glory to your name. God, we honor you. We glorify you. God, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, good morning. Today's message is a message to the people of God, to the church, to the ecclesia, to those that God has called out of the world and into his purpose. This word is a quickening. It is a shaking. It is to awaken the remnant. It is to light a fire. It is to cause us to long, long more, even the more, to hunger, even the more, to desire, even the more of the things of God. And also to wake up that desperation where we know that, you know what, God, I, I need you more than, and I desire you even more than my, my next breath. This is the desperation in this hour because there are people that are dying all over the world who still do not know who God is. And the Lord wants us to go out and to make disciples of all men. And so, you know what? We've got to be about our father's business. This is not the time to play church. This is not the time to pretend. This is not the time to seek man's approval or notoriety or recognition. But this is the time that we must be about our father's business. So we will begin with this message on today. And Apostle Herbie told me, he says, remember, we, we try to keep it to an hour. So this is our hour of power, but we are also led by the Holy Spirit. So he understands and I understand as well that there are times that we may go over our hour of power because when the Holy Spirit gets to moving, we have to sit back and let go and let God have his way. Amen. So don't let your comfort zone become your crypt. The Lord has given us a word for his people. And the word is, don't let your comfort zone become your crypt. As you can see on this first slide, we actually have the crypt that is in a cemetery. My God. On the first slide here, representing the very crypt. When we stay in our comfort zone too long, when we don't want to step outside of the status quo, when we don't want to step out of the boat, we begin to spiritually die in that place of comfort. We're going to look at the definition of comfort zone. Comfort zone in the Cambridge Dictionary is a situation in which you feel comfortable and in which your ability <clears throat> and determination are not being tested. So when we're in this comfort zone, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, the definition of comfort zone, it's, it's when we're in a situation or some type of a circumstance that we feel so very comfortable, we relax. You know, we, we plan ourselves there in that situation um, or. And then we get to a place where we lose the ability to be determined to do anything else my God. And we're not being tested. You see, in order for us to grow in the things of God, we're going to be tested. We don't want to be cut. We don't want to be circumcised. But guess what? All of that comes with growth. If you look at a tree and if you notice that the tree stops producing the fruits 
then the, the person, if it's a farmer or if it's a, if it's someone at their house, but especially if it's a farmer or if it's someone here in Florida, like the citrus trees in the groves, when the, when the fruit is not where it needs to be, if it's not producing the fruits that they want to see, then what happens is they go out and they cut the trees back. That's called the pruning. They'll cut them back and sometimes they have to do this more than once. And when they cut them back, the tree begins to spring up again and it begins to grow new branches, new leaves and new fruit. It's supposed to produce more. So don't get offended. Don't get upset. Don't get discouraged when you have to get corrected because it's a part of the pruning process. And without the cutting, without the pruning, there will be no new growth Amen. because you have to cut away all of the dead things in order to get the live things to spring up again. When we look at the definition of the comfort zone in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says the level at which one functions with ease and familiarity. So in other words, when, when you're in your comfort zone, everything is easy. There's no struggle. Uh, uh, you're not uncomfortable. You don't have to challenge yourself. You don't have to push yourself. You don't have to really go out of your way, but you just sit where you are in the comfort zone and you plant yourself there. There's no struggle. There's no determination. My God, you've literally lost the need to get up and to go higher in the things of God, to do more in the things of God. You've, you've fallen into the trap of the status quo. You've gotten to a place where you've just set yourself down and you've said, well, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so is doing it, so why can't I do it? Why do I have to get up at 12 a.m. and pray? Why do I have to fast? Why do I have to consecrate? When they're not doing it and they're being recognized and they're moving up, it's not about them, it's about you. See, we need to understand that coming out of our comfort zone it is for us. And not only is it for us, it's an individual choice. You know, if we begin to look at what everyone else that is professing that their Christians are doing, then guess what? We've lost sight of God. But when we can put on spiritual blinders, that God, I'm not looking to the left nor to the right. God, but I'm staying focused on you. I'm going down the street called straight and narrow. God, I'm not hitting any of the curves. I'm not going around the bend, but God, I'm staying focused on you and your will for my life. Because you know what? The word of God tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So why are we so busy worrying about what man is doing rather than trying to make sure we're right with God? Because man doesn't have to give an account. We do individually, not our children, not our husband, not our wives. Not the, not the sheep in the church. And if you're a leader, you are responsible for your life. It's a self-case. The dictionary meaning of the word crypt is an underground room or vault beneath a church used as a chapel or a burial place. It is a tomb. It is a vault. It is a mausoleum. It is a burial chamber. It is a sepulcher. It is a catacomb. When we look at the crypt in a cemetery, the term crypt refers to the actual storage area for a casket that contains the remains of an individual. Staying in one's comfort zone is effortless. You become complacent and you fall into a false sense of security because of its familiarity. Your comfort zone does not challenge you. It doesn't stretch you. It doesn't cause you to pursue your purpose. Your comfort zone is a holding place. It is a dressing room or a parlor of your transition. I'm going to read that one more time. Somebody need to hear that this morning. Your comfort zone is a holding place. It is a dressing room or a parlor of your transition. It is the pause from your alpha to your omega. It is the in-between time in which you exist in a mortal body. So ask yourself, what have you done in the time that God has allowed in the things that he has allowed you to represent for him 
in between the dash. What do I mean about the dash? Whenever you look on um, a program for someone who has died, you will see the word, the beginning or the end, the alpha, the omega, the sunrise or the sunset. But in between that is the dash. The dash is the in-between time. The dash is the amount of time God has allowed you here on earth. What have you done for the kingdom? What have you done for God? What have you done for the people? Have you been obedient? Have you been submitted to the things of God and to the will of God? Have you walked out your purpose? Or should I even say, do you even know what your purpose is? My God, help us, Jesus. It is in the place, the dash, in which you are waiting to die. My God, help me, Jesus. Don't let your comfort zone become your crypt, people of God. Know when to shift, my God. Know when you've outstayed a place. Know when God has said, okay, you, you've already gone here. I've already processed you in this season. I need you to move on. I need you to go higher. I need you to, deep, to dig deeper. I need you to go to higher heights and deeper depths. I don't need you to stay at the same level, but I need you to encounter the stretching, the correction, the pruning. I need you to be uncomfortable. I, why? Because I need you to grow in me, said the Lord thy God. Apostle, go ahead. Just a No when to ship. Do not stay there and die. Never outstay the place God has already shifted you out of. Ship. Mm. <clears throat> uh, um, Lord, help us, help us, Jesus. The Lord spoke to my husband and myself in March of 2020. He said to us, now this was personal. This, this may not be for you, but this was for Apostle Herbie and myself. Because, see, we, we are the kind of people that we have such love, such adoration, such compassion to push other people to, to, to want to desire to fulfill, to see them fulfill their destinies. And so we didn't get comfortable, but we stayed in places and operated in positions that God said, I've already graduated you from that level. I, I've called you not to pastor a building or a church or a people, but I've called you to pastor other pastors as apostles. My God, I've called you to be the teacher. I've called you to be a pastor. I've called you to be the evangelist that go out to different nations, to different places, to different people in the highways and hedges. I've called you as an eagle eye prophet, someone that's able to see beyond the veil. My God. But I've also called you to set government as I called Apostle Paul, my God. So we had to understand that when we had to shift to a new place of elevation, and it wasn't anything man did, but it was something God did. See, we need to understand that in the body today. You don't just graduate from one level to the next level. Let me just kill this right here, right now, Apostle. There's a spirit going on. That if I've been a teacher in the church, now it's time for me to be a pastor. If I've been a pastor in the church, now it's time for me to evangelize. If I've evangelized, now it's time for me to be a prophet. Now, if I, if, if and, and let me tell you something, there's a spirit of prophecy, a gift of prophecy. There's an office in the function of the prophet. That's the mantle grace of God. Now, we need to understand something. Just because you're able to get a word from God and you're able to relate that back to the people of God does not mean you are a prophet. Ah, somebody going to help me this morning. So when the spirit of prophecy comes in, it, it is given to the Christians. Why? Because we are Holy Spirit filled. Anyone that's Holy Spirit filled will be able to prophesy through the spirit of prophecy. Ah, there's also the gift of prophecy, also connected to the Holy Spirit. But then when there is the office of the prophet, there is a mantle, grace of God, that has been set forth as a foundational function and a gift for the people to build, to edify, my God, the church. That's what it is. We need to stop the madness. 
Then people, they go from being a prophet, then they say they're an apostle. Okay. How can we be an apostle if we can't set govern and run our own house? I'm helping somebody. How can we be a prophet when we're blind as Bartimaeus and we don't see what's going on to the people and to the church? How can we be an evangelist? Okay, let's, let's go here. The apostle is the government. Uh, the prophet guides. The evangelist uh, gathers. What type of heart do you have? If you say God has called you to be an evangelist. The pastor guards the sheep. He wants the best for the sheep. Even if the sheep wants to kick against the prick, they still want the best for the sheep. Rather they're with them or rather they're going, they're not going to kill the sheep. They're going to pray and ask God to help the sheep. They're going to ask God, Lord, I pray that they continue to keep you first in everything that they do because their time with us had run out. Whoever it may be, that's what every leader need to be saying. And if people go out and talk about you, leader, let them talk. Let them talk. Don't worry about it. Keep moving. Why? Because they're exposing themselves to the attacks of the enemy even the more. They're exposing themselves because they're professing, but people are seeing their true nature. And they're noticing that you're walking, you're keeping on on the things of God. You're not being distracted. You're not worrying about the naysayers. You're not hurt worrying about the hates, the haters, the, the haterade. You're not worried about that. But they know who you are. And you don't have to defend yourself because God vindicates his people. My God. And then we look at the teacher. The teacher grounds us in the word of God. So begin to ask yourself, are you grounded? Are you guarded? Are you gathering? Are you guiding? And are you governing in the body? When the Lord spoke to my husband and I, remember this is personal, in March of 2020, and he said to us, I never called you to a building. I called you to a people. That right there was letting us know, okay, you've known it, you've seen it, you've sensed it, you've discerned it. It's time to shift. We had to shift. And we thank God for the shift. We thank God for the freedom to go and to do what God has called us to do. We thank God for it. And you know what? We thank God we humble ourselves even the more. And we keep seeking the deeper things of God for his will to be done in our lives for the people he has called us to. We understand that when the Lord began to tell us, you've been in the same place far too long. Don't let your comfort zone become your crib. Many of you were sent on assignments in your zigzag, but you became comfortable there. The very place that was meant to equip you has become the very place you will die if you do not shift. Don't stay in your comfort zone too long and die. What was once comfortable to you has become your crib. You can't allow a temporary place nor temporary people, my God, become the reason you get comfortable and you die in your crypt, my God. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Holy Ghost. Mm. My God. Your comfort zone. We're going to talk about the epiphany of Peter. On this slide, you see Peter. He steps out of the boat. Everybody else, the other disciples are still in the boat. Uh, was it not Peter when Jesus began to ask them, but who do you say I am? And everybody else was saying, but thou say that, many say that you are Elias. They will call it all these other names. And Peter said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, I'm paraphrasing it. It's in the word. And Jesus said to Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who art in heaven. Ah, come on, somebody. See, Peter had insight where other people were blind. Yes, Peter denied him three times. But Jesus also said to Peter three times, Peter, feed my sheep. And he answered the call. Come on, somebody. We've got to understand. Peter had a temper. Peter wasn't patient. Ah, 
Peter denied Christ three times, but guess what? The Peter's name means stone, rock. Guess what? Peter is a part of that solid foundation that Christ says we shall build the church upon. The Lord is looking for people to be radical in faith. He's looking for people to be sound in doctrine. He's looking for people to be sound on a solid foundation, standing on a solid foundation, built on Jesus, the chief cornerstone, and the, the foundation also being of the apostle and the prophet. How can we leave all of this out and say it is of God when it's not? Psalms 127 and 1 says, except God builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Ah, come on, somebody. Ask yourselves, leaders, did God build your house? I'm going on. The epiphany of Peter, your comfort zone. Peter was in the comfort zone, y'all. Peter though he was among the other disciples in the comfort of the boat, he realized, I desire to, fire, to follow Jesus. Peter stepped out on the water knowing Jesus wouldn't let him drown. See, Peter had faith. Peter had insight. Ah, Peter knew that Jesus, if Jesus can walk on water and I've been walking with him, I've been eating with him, I've been praying with him, I've been fasting with him, I've been around his grace and his mantle that's on his life. If Jesus can do it, then guess what? I'm going to follow Jesus. Get out of your comfort zone today. Get out of the boat today. Do not stay in your comfort zone and it becomes your crypt where you spiritually die. My God. Go ahead, Apostle. Jesus walked on the water. Mm, mm, mm. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22 to 25, reading from the ESV. Immediately, immediately, he made the disciple get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Mm -hmm. And after he had dismissed the crowd, he went up. He went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Mm -hmm. When evening came, he was there alone. For the boat, um, for the boat, mm -hmm. the boat. By the time, um. Long was it was a long way from the land okay. beaten by the wave, for the wind was against them, and the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. Now listen, we began to understand something in verse 22 here. Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship mm -hmm. or the boat. They were, they might have been afraid. They may have felt that this was outside of their jurisdiction to get on this boat to go way out into the deep with him. Uh, but they got on anyway. And when they got onto this boat, they had dismissed the crowd and they were far way off from the land. Mm -hmm. The waves were were tossing the boat to and for grievously, grievously. And then we began to understand that it was the fourth watch mm -hmm. when Jesus divided the night into the three watches consisting of four each. The first watch is mentioned in Lamentations 2 and 19. The second watch is mentioned in Judges 7 and 19. The third watch is mentioned in Exodus 14 and 24. And the fourth watch, is mentioned in the part of the Old Testament. This division of the Romans, of, of the book of Romans, had introduced and had been introduced in Judea. When we began to understand what John 11 and 19 says, is that the first nine. watch began, huh? Um, John 11 and 9, it begins to say that the first watch began at six o'clock in the evening and continued until nine o'clock. The second watch begins at nine and continued to 12. And the third watch began at 12 and continued to three. 
The next one will begin at three and continue to six. So we, we need to understand that we were looking at Jesus in the third watch, it said, walking on the water. Mm -hmm. He's coming out of the boat. We understand that he's suspended on the sea. My God, somebody need to catch this. There's no gravitation there. He's defied the very laws of gravitation, men and women of God. But Jesus is walking on the water. How would you have react? Think about this. If you were one of the 12 disciples in that boat and Jesus steps out of the boat, they're far off from the land. Now remember, so they're in the deep. They're out in the depth of the sea and he gets out of the boat and he's walking on water. He's defied the natural laws of gravity. Ah, my God. He's walking on water, but he's not going under. Some of you need to understand you're staying in your comfort zone because you're doubting who God is in your life truly. You're staying in your comfort zone because you're afraid to get out of the boat. You're staying in your comfort zone because you're wondering, God, are you really going to catch me? Lord, it's not that I don't trust you, God, but God, I just don't see. And I hear God saying, what you need to do is get out of your flesh and step over into the spirit. Because in the spirit, Peter got out of the boat. The faith was quickened. And Peter got out of the boat and left the other disciples behind because they're still looking at things in the flesh. But oh God, if I get if I get off and, and I get out of the boat, if I stand outside of the boat, I'm gonna drown. God, I'm gonna go down. And I hear God saying, No, no, no. If I called you to it, I'm gonna bring you through it. Yes, Lord. I hear God say, if you get out of the comfort zone, see, the problem is God has called many of you in this hour and in this season, but you're stuck in the boat. You're stuck in the status quo. You're stuck in going to the same places. You're stuck hearing the same words. You're stuck ready to hang on the same word, my God. And you will not get out of the boat. But I hear God say, it's time to shift. Come on, now. It's time to go. It's time to get out of the boat. Yes, my God. Step outside of your comfort zone. Zone. Don't allow your comfort zone to become your crypt. Do not die in the place that God called you to that was temporary. Ah, when the Lord sent David to Ziglag, that wasn't his promise. My God, help me, Jesus. He sent him there temporary. Come on. Ah. That's why he had to cause all hell to break loose. That's why he allowed them to come in to ravage the village when him and the, and the army was gone, to take his wives, to take the children. Why? Because God was trying to get his attention. But as we're going to see in this message, uh, regardless of what the enemy tries to do to you, even in your zigzag, God is going to repay you. He's going to cause you to recover it all. My God, you didn't lose anything, woman of God. You haven't lost anything, man of God. It doesn't matter how you're going through in this season. Get out of your comfort zone. God has so much more for you. God says, I need you to shift because there's a people that's awaiting your sound. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, on, Apostle. Yeah, I'm getting ahead yeah. of myself. My God, your comfort zone. We're going somewhere this morning, y'all. Y'all just hang in there. Your comfort zone. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 26 to 33. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, is it a ghost, my God? And they cried out in fear. 27 says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. I want to ask you all something. How is it? I'm trying not to lose it, y'all. How is it? These are the same disciples that had been with Jesus, that had walked with Jesus, that had ate with Jesus, that had slept where he slept, that had fasted with him, that had prayed with him, that had consecrated with him. How is it that they did not recognize him? At this appointed time, walking on water. And I hear God saying, there are people around you 
that know you, that see you, that hear you, that should know you intimately. If they really don't know who you are, my God, help me, Jesus. God, help me, Jesus. I hear God say, but do not let that stop you, my son. Do not let that stop you, my daughter. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your boat. Begin to seek my will. Begin to seek my face. Begin to seek my hand. Sit at my feet. Listen to me. Shut off the TV sometimes. Turn down the plate sometimes. Consecrate yourself. Get in a place with me. Shut off some of the voices that are trying to speak into your life and over your life. My God, help me, Jesus. This is the season. I need you at my feet. This is the season you're beginning to see clearly now. This is the season I've called you to be intercessor. This is the season you're seeing men and women of God that you love that are falling from grace. Men and women of God that have lost their zeal. Men and women of God that are struggling mentally, emotionally, financially, and physically. But I hear God saying today, help me Jesus, that what I need you to do is pray. I'm showing you correctly. You're seeing correctly, but I need you to pray. I need you to lay out on your face. I need you to call on heaven. I need you to pull heaven down because they've been wounded. They've been afflicted. They've fallen and they don't know how to get up. But I hear God saying, daughter, it's you. I need you to open up your mouth. I need you to be the one to speak a word. I need you to pray when nobody knows you're praying. I need you interceding when nobody knows you're interceding. I need you to do it. I need you to do it. Because guess what? There's a lot of leaders going through people of God. But Apostle Herbie and I have come to say, but where are the errands? Help me, Jesus. Where are the errands? Who's holding up the hands of the leaders? Go ahead. <clears throat> um, 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 the verse 28 said, verse 28 said, 28 said, Can Peter, Peter answer him, Lord, if it is you, command, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. You see what happens is that we have you understand because we see that you understand we see how could in that boat all his disciples um um in that boat but Peter he's the one who had the faith he was had the faith to ask Jesus bid him to come so Peter started walking on the water so while he was on the water walking on, on the water he was his <clears throat> His focus is on yes, on Jesus, mm -hmm. on the Messiah. Mm -hmm. He walking on water. Mm -hmm. So long as you you have a focus on the Lord, yes, you can do anything but fail. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But he walking yes, and so what happened? He walking on the water. Mm -hmm. Now, for the moment he yes, hasn't that wind came. Yes, and he get distracted mm -hmm. and he started to sink. He take his eyes off of him. Mm -hmm. That is what some of us here. Mm -hmm. Yes, and who come on doing who come on doing the same thing? Yes, and they had a mind, yes, and focus on, on the Lord. Mm -hmm. for, for they're coming and get distracted. Mm -hmm. for, yes, and for, for uh, he say and she say, or oh, who in the ears? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and they get astray. My Keep God. your mind on the prize. My God, my God, Apostle. Mm. Where you at? I don't even know where he at, y'all. That was getting so good. Okay, verse 30 says. Mm -hmm. But when he saw when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, "Lord, save me!" Like Apostle Herbert said, if we just keep our eyes on Jesus, no matter what may come, no matter what we're going to mm -hmm. have to endure in this race, y'all, because we have to understand that it says in the Word of God that in order to reign with Him, yes, we're going to first suffer with yes, Him. My God. God, help me, Jesus. Isn't it something how as soon as the wind came, like Apostle Herbie was just saying, Peter got distracted and he took his eyes off Jesus. 
and he began to sink. Oh my God. But then in verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took a hold of him saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? My God, people of God, we've come to tell you today, keep your eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do not doubt, huh? you're coming out, my God. Mm -hmm. Do not doubt, I heard that thing in my spirit, you're coming out. I hear God say, you're coming out with nothing missing. You're coming out with nothing broken. You're coming out with nothing lacking. And you're coming out stronger. God, I hear God saying, you're not going under, but you're going over. Yes, Lord. You're not going under, but you're going through the mountain. My God. Ah, help me, Jesus. Mm. I'm trying to contain myself, y'all. Help me contain myself. 32 says, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. That was a test, y'all. <laughs> yes, God. You see, Jesus took them out into the unfamiliar, out of their comfort zone in the boat, out into the depths of the sea. And he was showing them by being the example. Somebody better get this today. That if I get out this boat and I step outside my comfort zone, if I can walk on water, so can you. Whatever you see me do, you shall do, and greater work shall you do. My God. Jesus was the example. He was showing the disciples. But only Peter had the faith to get out the boat. But even though he got out the boat, the wind distracted Peter, and he began to go down. But even then, people of God, Jesus reaches out. And he brings them up. My God, somebody better catch this. I know you may feel like you're drowning at times, but I hear God say, I've got you. I'm not going to let you ground. I'm not going to let you drown. I'm not going to let you go under. Ah, my God, help me, Jesus. And we begin to understand in verse 33, and those in the boat worship him saying, truly, you are the son of God. All of these miracles, signs, and wonders that followed him. All of this time that they had been with Jesus. And you mean to tell me it took you all of this to realize who he is? The devil is a liar. No. When you have been sick in your body, ah, he has been your Jehovah Jireh. He's been your Jehovah Rapha. He's been Elohim. He's been El Shaddai, my God. He's been Jehovah Nisi, my God. He's been the God of all things in your life. He has kept you. He has covered you. He has protected you. By now, we should know who Jesus is. My God, help me. Help me, God. Mm. We gonna move on because I've been on that stuck right there and losing. We're gonna look at some people that didn't allow their comfort zone to become their crib. Mm -hmm. We look at Peter. Mm -hmm. Peter was one of the twelve disciples. Peter had a um had a connection with God. Mm -hmm. How do we? I know that because he recognized who Jesus was that he was the deity that he was the living son of Jesus that of J Jesus was the living son of the Lord. Uh, come on, somebody. That's the epiphany. He also had the insight to know what was going on when he stepped out of the boat and began to walk towards Jesus. Mm -hmm. He had a connection, y'all. Peter saw past the natural realm. Peter is called the was is was called and is called the rock. His name means rock. Peter, even though he denied Jesus three times. Mm, but he still fed his sheep. We look at Moses. Moses was raised in the palace. Mm -hmm. He was strategically placed by God. Yeah. He was an Israelite. Come on now. Ah, come on somebody. He was raised with Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And the Lord sent him back to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Yeah. See, God will put you in a comfort zone in unfamiliar places for an unfamiliar process so that God can use you to uh, unfamiliar people. Somebody better catch that right there. The Israelite children 
were in bondage 400 years. They cried out to God. They suffered many things. They were kinsmen of Moses. Come on, somebody better catch that thing. And they were set free by God. We look at David and Ziglag. He told in Ziglag. It wasn't his promise. He was processed for greater in his Ziglag, though. Uh, the enemy attempted, the Amalekites attempted to destroy David in Ziglag. And Ziglag was a temporary place. Uh, but guess what? David recovered all that they had taken. Mm -hmm. He recovered his people. He recovered his things and then some. He recovered his, his livestock and then some. And the word of God tells us that David recovered all. See, in this season, the enemy thought he had you. Mm -hmm. The enemy thought he killed you. The enemy thought he destroyed you. The enemy thought he had amputated your legs that you could not move for the things of God. But I hear God say, it was a test and then you've passed the test. Yeah. You have gone through this process. And I hear God say, now I can use you greater. Yeah. You're going to another dimension. You're going to another level. You're going to another realm in God. Yes, sir. And all of that other stuff that you had to overcome, God said it was nothing but a stepping stone. And every time you begin to step, you will go into another level. You will go into another dimension. You will go into another place of elevation in me, said the Lord thy God. We're going to look at David real quick. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 17 and 19. And David <coughs> smoked them from the twilight even mm -hmm. unto the evening of the next day. Mm -hmm. And they escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men. We rode, <clears throat> rode upon camels mm -hmm. on fleet. Mm -hmm. It is said, and David recovered all that the Carmelites mm -hmm. had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great. Neither sons nor daughters. Um spoils, nor anything, <clears throat> anything that they had taken to them, mm -hmm. David recover all. Yes, God. You begin to see in first Samuel chapter 30, verse 17 through 19 is what we did, but um a lot of times you may want to read down to verse 20. But it begins to tell us that the the Amalekites had taken David's spoil, they had taken David's women and everything. David goes right back. He defeats the Amalekites. He recovers the women. He recovers the spoil. Honey, let me tell you something. David recovers all. In this season, you haven't lost anything. Mm -hmm. I hear God saying everything that the enemy thought that he stole from you, God says, I'm giving it back 100 fold. <clears throat> He said, get ready for restitution. Get ready for reciprocity. Get ready to be restored. Get ready for some things to be renewed. Get ready for relationships to be bonded. Get ready for people to begin to see who you are. In me, said the Lord thy God. When we understand the word recovered in the Hebrew or rescued or delivered, we begin to understand that it is translated that it means that it had been carried away or had taken in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 19. Recovered is literally meaning cause to restore, excuse me, cause to return and restored. So David didn't lose anything. <clears throat> Let's say that what happened with the Amalekites, they came in, they took David's stuff, and they ended up having to give it back and then some. So there are some things that some of you may have lost that the enemy may have stolen and he have taken from you prematurely. <clears throat> it may be your finances. It may be your family. It may be your children. But I hear God say, I'm causing the enemy to have to give it all back. Mm -hmm. For he shall restore unto you the years that the palm of worm, the canker worm, the locust, and the caterpillar had eaten. <clears throat> I hear God say he's gonna cause the he's gonna cause the enemy to vomit up your stuff. My God, he's gonna cause the enemy to give you back your stuff. Help me, Jesus. 
Now, y'all, I want y'all to see this. This is powerful right here. <clears throat> My sinus is acting up, so y'all just roll with me. We look at Ezekiel 37. Mm. On this slide, you can see Ezekiel standing out, and he's prophesying to the bones, the dry bones. <clears throat> and the dry bones are getting up. They're getting in position to war. And it reads, this is what the Lord told Apostle Herbie and I for this message. Son of man, if you stay in your comfort zone, who were prophesied to the dry bones? Mm. I'm going to read that one more time. Somebody need to catch this. Son of man, male or female, somebody better catch this. If you stay in your comfort zone, who were prophesied to the dry bones? The Lord began to tell me. He said, daughter, you're going to have to get back on social media. I know you don't want to do it. I know it grieves your spirit. He says, but if the real stay off, the counterfeit will wreak havoc. Mm. That thing good right there. If the real stay off social media platforms, then the counterfeit will wreak havoc on the people. So son of man, if you stay in your comfort zone, who were prophesied to the dry bones? We're looking at Ezekiel 37 verse 1 through 5. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, mm -hmm. which was full of bone, and caused me to pass by them round about. Mm -hmm. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very, very dry. Mm -hmm. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know us again. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones, and said unto them, O ye dry bone, hear the word of the Lord. Mm. Thus said the Lord God unto <clears throat> these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Listen, Ezekiel 37 and 1. It tells us that the hand of the Lord was upon me, upon prophet Ezekiel. And the prophetic influence was communicated in this way. The, and, and he was carried out in the spirit. And the Lord brought him into, in the spirit to the place, to a spiritual vision in which there was a, a valley of dry bones. The valley was full of the dry bones. Mm -hmm. This very vision of the valley of dry bones is designed for us to understand the wretched state of the people, of the Jews, uh, of the Israelite children. It is for us to understand the resurrection. When we look at the fact that what the Valley of Dry Bone represents, it represents today's church, a bunch of spiritually dead people in the church. My God. Sitting in pews, standing in pulpits. Because remember, catch this now. Remember, when we look at King Saul, King Saul, the Lord had ripped the kingdom from his hand, the anointing. Everything was stripped from Saul. But Saul was still functioning and operating even though the grace and the anointing had left him. The Lord began to tell me, there's a whole lot of people I've already fired and they must repent and come back to me. But they're still operating and they're still functioning and they're still messing people up. My God, this is what Saul did. Because over in the book of Romans, it tells us that his gifts are given without repentance. Mm -hmm. Whenever God gives you something, he doesn't take it back. Come on now. Come on now. But see, what's missing is, I can, you know what? I can still preach. I can still prophesy. These are people that God's fired. I'm not throwing off on nobody. I'm just saying in general. Anybody that God has fired, if God called them to preach the gospel, if God called them to prophesy to the people, if God called them to be an apostle to govern, if God called them to be an evangelist to, go to gather, if God called them to be a teacher to ground, he does not take the gift back. They are functioning, but they are without grace. They are without anointing. They will not be able to impact. They will not be able to transform. The miracles, the signs, and the wonders will be void. They are a sounding symbol, making a noise, but having no power. Mm. Ah, shut up, Jesus. Help me, God. Help me. We begin to understand this. Mm. 
This is an open field, y'all, of a bunch of spiritually dead people. We can see this happening right now in the church. Help us, God. And we can understand that the Lord began to say to him in verse three, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? Apostle and I have come to ask you today, men and women of God, can these bones live? Ah, ah, my God. And I answered, oh Lord, thou knowest. In other words, God, only you know. Because even though Ezekiel was a prophet, I often help somebody. He was able to see behind the veil. He was able to hear from God. But what Ezekiel saw was a bunch of dry, dead bones. And he said, God, it's going to take a miracle. It's going to take you. God, only you know if these bones can live. Ah, uh, then verse four, the Lord began to say unto him again, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. God is saying, I need you out of your comfort zone so you can begin to prophesy life where many have died in the spirit. They cannot be resurrected if the prophet does not speak. They will remain a valley of dry bones. They will remain dead. They will remain ineffective. They will remain powerless. They will remain unimpactful. They will remain untransforming. God help me, Jesus. I need the real prophetic voices to stand up. Help us, God. Say unto these dry bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into them and ye shall live. We need to understand something, y'all. If we don't go and if we don't speak, who's going to prophesy to the bones? Who's going to prophesy to the bones? Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 6 through 10. We going somewhere, y'all. And I will lay sinew upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, mm -hmm. and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied mm. as I was commanded, and I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, shaking, and the bones came together, bones to his bone. Mm. And when I behold, lo, the sinew, the sinew and the flesh came up mm -hmm. upon them, and this and the skin covered them above. Mm -hmm. Above, but there was no bread in them. Mm. Nine said, Then said unto him, unto me, prophesy unto the winds, prophesy, son of man, <clears throat> and say to the winds, Thus said the Lord God, come from the four wings mm. of bread, mm -hmm. and bread upon these these slain, and they made and they may live. Mm. So I prophesied as I commanded. And the breath came into them, mm -hmm. and they lived and stood upon them, mm -hmm. their feet an exceedingly great army. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> so we begin to understand in Ezekiel 37 and 6, when he says, I will lay sinews upon. And we begin to look and observe this very process. Uh, the first thing we understand is here are the bones. The bones are the people. Somebody better catch this. The second thing is the ligaments called here, the sinews, are to be added in order to unite the bones that the skeletons might be complete. So we understand that first right here, that when he began to lay the sinews upon it, talking about Ezekiel 37 and 6, the first thing, the bones are the people. The second thing, the ligaments and the sinews mm -hmm. that were added to the bones to join the skeleton that might become a complete man. It is called for the unity in the church and in the body of God. When we begin to understand the third thing, that the flesh, the whole muscular system, the subjacent, that is the subjacent and subjacent muscles. And then we begin to um, understand that including the arterial and the venous system. Uh, that begins to clothe the very skeleton. This, the Lord began to, this is insight God gave us. 
that the, this is the governmental function of the heaven, the governmental function of heaven built on Jesus, the chief cornerstone and the apostles and the prophets as the foundation. Uh, so the body of Christ will be the church that is built on a solid foundation. And then when the Lord began to say that he began to lay the skin or the dermis or the epidermis or the cutis or the cuticle. Uh, I know I'm going medical on y'all today, but y'all just ride with me. Uh, we begin to understand that this is what envelops uh, the whole of the muscles of the flesh. Uh, and now these bodies are in a state that the body of Adam was in before it received uh, the intellect principle from God. Mm. Many members, but one body fitted together to accomplish the will of God. The fifth thing is there was no breath in them. They had not received their spirit. Uh, just like Adam, they had not received the Ruach, the breath of God. The sixth thing is the wind ha, or the Ruach, the soul that came into them when the Ruach came, the breath of God. They were endued with the intellect and with the life. They rose up and it was evidence of a complete restoration to life. And they, forget, they began to perform its function according to Ezekiel 37 and 10. This is when the Holy Spirit called forth from the four winds from the four corners of the earth. Ah, and then we begin to understand when it says in verse nine, prophesied unto the wind, the Ruach addressing thyself to the soul and commanded to enter into these well-organized bodies that they may live. It is a finished work to accomplish the will and the purpose of God. When he began to call forth the four winds from the four corners of the earth, from come from all parts where ye are scattered, come from around the world, sons and daughters, reanimate these bodies from which ye have been so long separated. Come back into unity, come back into oneness, come back into wholeness. Because then and only then will God be able to use his people. We've got to be a unified body. The four winds signify all the parts in every direction. The soul, literally the soul, comes from the four souls. The breath from the four breaths, my God. And the four winds come from the four winds. But here the Ruach has both of its most general meaning. The wind, the breath, and the soul of God. My God, the Ruach has this. The Ruach represents in Ezekiel 37. It represents the wind, the breath, and the soul of God. My God, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Son of man, if you stay in your comfort zone and die in your crypt, who were prophesied to the dry bones, there's a mandate on your life and you cannot stay in your comfort zone any longer. Mm -hmm. If you stay in the place that was only temporary, it will become your crypt. It's time to get up. Mm -hmm. Ah, let me add something else. It's time to go. My Lord. Mm. You can't stay in the same place. You can't keep playing around with the same issues. When we begin to look at Ezekiel 37, verse 11, uh, what is it? 11 through 15, I think, 14. We're going to go ahead and read this, y'all. Ezekiel 37 uh, and 11 through 14. We're going to go ahead and read it. These bones are the whole house of Israel. What is, that is, the estate is representing represented by these bones and their restoration to their own land is represented by the qualification of these bones in verse 12 um um is you could tell you verse 12 i will open your grave here is the point allusion allusion to the 
general reconstruction, resurrection, resurrection and doctrine prosperity created and understood by the Jews. And to When I have, when I have, when I have opened your grave, when I shall have done for you what was beyond your hope, your hope and deem impossible, then then shall you know that I am Jehovah. That's verse 13 that he's touching on, and then verse 14 in Ezekiel 37 and 14. And shall put my my um spirit. Um, Ruha is taken, is taken from the Holy Ghost. There were, there were, um, there were, um, souls, animal and intellectual being when they had received, received their souls as mentioned above. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Okay. Three degrees or processes have been remarked in this um, vision that we're looking at when the prophet was commanded to prophesy um, to the, the, the dry bones, to take the authority of God and to bring restoration to the dry bones. The first thing is there was a noise which was followed by a general shaking during which the bones became arranged and united. Uh, so what we see right now that we've heard of sounds from heaven. There's been a shaking. There's been a rattling. We're beginning to see the counterfeit from the real. God is stripping butt naked. He's exposing those that are not his. He's exposing those that sent that were not that went but were not sent by him. He's exposing those that are professing that God sent them and he knows them not, nor does he know their work of division, of chaos, of rebellion, yes. of lawlessness, those of hatred. Oh my God, help me, Jesus. And so God is saying, I had to send the noise because the noise was the sound to my remnant. And anyone knows whenever there's a great move of God in the word of God, that sound always precedes a move. Ah, So we begin to understand the first thing about Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14, that there was a noise that was followed by the shaking, another noise. Yeah. Uh -huh. Come on, somebody. The sound, somebody say sound. Then we begin to understand that the body, the bones became arranged and united. So they started a rearranging themselves. The body began to come back into, in, into construction. The body began to, in other words, line up. That's good, right? Yes. Yeah. The body began to line up like the bones begin to line up. God is saying it's time for my people in my body, which are called by my name, that they got to humble themselves, pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways. Then you will hear from heaven and he will heal our land. Come on ah, that's a part of if my people, which are called by my name. Ah, come on, somebody. Y'all know the word. So then we begin to understand here. The bones begin to realign themselves. They were out of joint. They were out of order. Ah, come on, somebody. They were out of alignment with the spirit of God. But the dry bones, remember, represents the dead people in the church. Spiritually dead. Out of order, out of alignment, off of their assignment. And God says, I'm rearranging the body. I'm rearranging the bones. I'm causing realignment with my word. I'm causing realignment with my will. I'm causing realignment with my church. Jesus, help me, Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord. The third, the second thing is the flesh in the skin came upon them so that the dry bones were never seen. Let me help somebody right here. Everything that you do for God does not have to be promoted. It does, does not have to be seen. People do not have to hear about it because God is saying what you've done in the secret place, I'm getting ready to reward you openly. God help me, Jesus. Listen here. It's too often that we want to jump on social media every time we get a word. Every word that God gives you is not for everybody. Ah, but it's for it to be released at the right time in the right season. My God. The Holy Spirit just said to me, tell them, don't get ahead 
of me. <clears throat> so the skin covered the flesh to conceal the flesh. Somebody better catch this. The bones, the flesh, the skin. The unity is already taking place with the bones. The alignment has already taken place with the bone. The flesh has come over there to cover the bones, to be able to get the sinews to add so that they can move, that they can flex, that they can do the will and the work of God that God has called us to do in this hour, this season. But then he says, I got to conceal it. See, God will conceal you. Where have we been? I've been concealed. Where have we been? I've been in consecration. Where have we been? I've been at the feet of Jesus. But guess what? I'm coming out. <laughs> Get ready. Itinerary going up soon. Ah, help me, Jesus. Listen. The third thing is the spirit or the soul came into them and they stood up perfectly. <laughs> vivified, united in oneness, in wholeness. Mm. There was nothing missing. There was nothing broken. There was nothing lacking. Ah, They were strong. They stood erect. They were ready to go to war. They were ready for warfare. They were ready to call down heaven. They were ready to go and do God's will. They were, they were ready to blaze the trails, to open up new roads. They were ready to open up new territory. They were ready to open up new regions. They were ready to open up the eyes of the blind. They were ready to be the Ananias to call a soul on the road to Damascus. They was ready to lay hands on their eyes that the scales may fall off. Y'all ain't mean to come and preach like this today, but I got to just obey God. I got to obey God. Help me, Jesus. The Lord says it's time to get uncomfortable. Mm. Go ahead, Apostle. Mm. Now you got to feed that one. They're not going to be skipped yet. Mm, mm, mm. Listen. This is right here. It's time to get uncomfortable. Mm. In order to get something you've never had, mm -hmm. you've got to be willing to do what you've never done. Mm -hmm. See, I want to prophesy God, but I don't want to go through nothing. I want to prophesy, but 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 I don't I don't I don't want you to check ties, but I don't want you to correct me. I don't want to submit to spiritual authority. Uh, I want to prophesy, but but God, I, I don't I don't want to be reproved. I want to prophesy, but I just want to do what I want to do. I don't want to listen to my leader when they say you're not ready yet. You're not ready for that level of warfare. You're not ready to go to that level. Why? Because you still have unforgiveness. Because you're still holding animosity. Because you're still cussing. You're still tipping. You're still slipping. You're still lying. You're still bite bite. My God, your heart has not been circumcised. Sit down somewhere. I heard the song that the psalmist Colante Gavin sung. And that baby said on that song that the church is the only entity that will put weapons in the hands of people and they don't even know how to use them. Now, it's one thing for a leader to recognize who God is calling somebody to be and to try to disciple them into that. Mm -hmm. And them to just jump boat and, and feel like they have arrived because they got a piece of paper, they got some recognition, they got some notoriety and they move on. But see, they fail to understand the small print that there's still a season of two years minimum that you got to serve under whoever gave you your credentials. And if you don't stay in good standing with your tithing and, and, and with your obedience and your spiritual submission, not witchcraft, but doing all things according to 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, that all things must be done in decency and with order, that your credentials are null and void. They ain't got to reach out to you and tell you that. You should already know this. If you be a man or woman of God and really know, because guess what? God never just jumped out there and told the disciples, yeah, just go out there and do what you want. No, no, no. It was a season. It was some years that they had to walk with him before he commissioned them. So ask yourself, if you got some credentials from a leader, this going to help some people. Did they commission you or did they just release you? There's a difference in being released. Release means go on and let God send you where you have prayed and say that God has called you to go and where you say God has called you to do. And then guess what? God will put you in, 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 in connection with the right people that can commission you. Because until you're commissioned by an impossible, you're not released to really go out and do it. When you go sit up on another leader, guess what? You still got to be commissioned by an apostle. A pastor can give you the go ahead to go out and do something, but a pastor can't commission. Huh. 
a prophet can unlock spiritual giftings and callings and different things like that, unlock the mind and, and different things like that because they're speaking forth from the heart of God. But guess what? A prophet still can't commission you. Somebody better get some help this morning. That's why we have so much mess in the church now because people feel as though they can just jump up and do it. You can't just do it. You still got to stay under spiritual authority. Why? Because you still have to be held accountable, more so, more so, more so. Why? The word of God tells us that when we are minister of the gospel, God is holding us more accountable than anybody else. Mm. It's not a game. Amen. You can't play with it, people of God. Second <clears throat> Corinthians 12 and 9 says, and he said mm -hmm. unto me, my grace Come is on, sufficient yep. for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Let me help somebody. I tell people all the time, people have tried to mimic, people have tried to dress like, people have tried to minister like, all of this, and I tell people all the time, baby, walk on your own oil. Do what God has called you to do. I have people right now still call me saying, child, I, you know what, woman of God, you know what, I'm telling you, God really does use you to impact people because I still see people that are regurgitating and that are sharing. It's why, because that word blessed them. I still see people that are saying things and I know it's you, it's something that God gave you and they're taking it and running with, you know what I tell them, that's all right. Because that lets me know that they were impacted. That God used me to plant a seed and to transform their lives. And they picked that seed up and they ran with it. So guess what? That stuff don't bother me because I know who I am. And I tell people all the time that when the enemy thinks that I'm weak, when he thinks that he's overthrown, when he thinks that he's beat me down, when he thinks that he has won some ground, guess what? That's when my in my weakness, God's strength is made perfect in my afflictions. Every time I've been afflicted, every time I've suffered greatly, every time I've gone through, guess what, y'all? I've come out with a stronger anointing. I've come out with another elevation. I've come out with a greater glory. My God, help me, Jesus. And when I tell you all, if you know my story, you would understand the glory that precedes my life, that precedes apostles' life. We have served many. We have loved many, and we love many still. But guess what? There have been times that we have been cut. There have been times that our heart have physically been snatched out of our chest and been stumped on by the enemy that are using people that we love, that we honor, we respect, and we still pray for. We still intercede and we still cover and we still want the best for their lives. And you know what? This is why God knows he can trust us. This is why God knows he can use us because you know what? I feel like Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people do. I'm not going to take the platform that God has erected for us <clears throat> for a global platform. And I'm not going to give way to the enemy, but I'm going to keep my eyes on God and I'm going to keep moving in the things of God. Go ahead, Apostle. You were chosen, you were chosen on purpose for a purpose. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, reading from the Amplifier. So as God's own chosen people who are holy, set apart, sanctified for his purpose and well beloved by God himself, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, which has the power to endure whatever injustice or un unpleasantness comes with good temper. The Lord knew you even before he formed you. The Lord knew you before he spoke, spoke, he spoke you into existence. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, in the amplifier, before I form you in the womb, I knew you mm. and approve of you as my chosen instrument. And before you were born, consecrated you to myself as my own. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Listen, 
the Lord knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb, according to Jeremiah 1 and 5. The Lord knew you before he even spoke you into existence. Yes. He already put into your mantle everything that you were going to need to walk out this call in God. If God called you to be a prophet, then guess what? It doesn't matter who doesn't believe that you are who God says you are. But guess what? God has already qualified you. He's predestined you. He's already consecrated you unto himself as his own. Mm -hmm. And God is going to get the glory out of your life. Why? Because you were chosen on purpose for a purpose. Amen. Whatever that purpose is that God has chosen you for, man of God or woman of God, walk out that purpose. And for those of you globally connected with us all over the nation of Africa, all over the nation of India, all over the, Af the nation of uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, all of these different places around the world. We know that some of you are sleeping right now, but you will listen to this replay. And we pray that this shifts you from one level to another, that you get out of your comfort zone. Because if you stay there, you will die and it will become your crib. We're going to move on. My God. We're almost there, y'all. We're almost there. You have been processed for purpose. Mm. I want somebody to catch that this morning. You have been processed for purpose. We begin to understand something. <clears throat> I want to touch on this and I'm going to ride on out. We look at the Bible and we look at Moses and we look at um, Joshua. Everybody else, when it talks about in the word, when um, Joshua was there with Moses and whenever Moses would leave and Moses would um, leave the tent of meetings that was, it was pitched afar off from where the people were, you know, set up. And it says that Joshua would stay in the tent. Joshua would stay in the glory. Joshua would stay in the presence of God. Even when Moses had left out of the tent, Joshua stayed in the presence of God. Listen, I heard God say this, and this is why I got to drop this nugget. The Lord says, when everybody else left, when everybody else walked away, when everybody else threw in the towel, when everybody else backslid, when everybody else forgot about, when everybody else went their own way, when everybody else felt they arrived, when everybody else felt as though, you know, whatever it may be, X, Y, Z. I'm talking family. I'm talking church ministries. I'm talking children. I'm talking whatever the situation may have been. The Lord said, but you stayed faithful. You stayed humble. And God says, and your reward shall be even greater. If anyone knows the word of God, they understand that Joshua was a successor to Moses. Moses was one of the greatest pastors. He, When he went into Egypt and set the Israelites free, there were millions. And he took them out, even though they wandered for 40 days and 40 years, excuse me, for 40 years in the desert, 40 years. Joshua was the one that was able to complete what God had started in Moses. He completed in Joshua. So God is saying that, you know what? Because of your faithfulness, I'm going to have to bless you. Because of your faithfulness, I'm going to bring you out. And when I bring you into this land flowing with milk and honey, your place of promise, God says it's going to be better than you could have ever imagined. Because you did not quit. You did not leave. You did not throw in the towel. You did not get to the place that you got frustrated and you did not say to yourself, enough is enough. But guess what? God says, because of your faithfulness, your faithfulness has qualified you and you've been processed for purpose. Your process may not be their process, nor will your all be their all. Somebody need to grab that. Don't complain about your process. Just go through it. If you don't shift, you will die in your comfort zone. We look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 48, it says. For the one, for the one who, for the one who did not know it and, and did things worthy, worthy of, of a beating, will receive <clears throat> only a few lashes from everyone to whom much have been given much will be required mm. and to whom they entrusted much of him they will ask they will ask or call them more mm. in luke 
And just read it. You can read the um. You want to do well? Just do the ESV form too, but different okay. translation. Okay, this one is from the um, ESV. But the one, but the one who, but the one who do not know, do not know, and did what deserve um a beating. <clears throat> Will receive, will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will require, and from him to 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 whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Let me shut it out with um Luke 12 and 48, the same verse, y'all. In the King James translation, it says, But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes, when we know better. And we keep doing it. When we keep committing the same sins, when we keep doing the same things that's, un that's displeasing to God, then guess what? We shall be beaten. <clears throat> We're going to have to give an account. But this says, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. The Lord is saying, to whom much is given, much is required. If God has given you much, he requires much more from you. Stop looking at the glass as half empty and look at the glass as half full. And say, God, you know what? I need my cup. I need my glass to overflow. God, I need more of you. God, I need you to do more for me. God, I, I need to... I need you to, to rend my heart and not my garment. God, I need you to take out all the ugliness. Lord, I need you to take out all the hurt. Lord, I need you to take out all the betrayal. Lord, I need you to take out all of the rejection. God, I need you to, I need you to heal me. I need to be complete. I need to be whole. And I need you, God. I need you to do a work in me. Three more slides. This, this is one of the three. <clears throat> it's time to go. Mm -hmm. You cannot stay in the same place. Resuscitating the same people. Come on on. Going around the same mountain. Mm. Drinking from contaminated brooks and streams. Eating from poison tables. Listening to compromised messages. Mm -hmm. Having a form of godliness. Pacifying the same demons. Come on. Stroking the egos of unsubmitted people to the word of God. My God, that's good right there. Stroking the egos huh, of unsubmitted people to the word of God. Pouring out on vessels that don't have the ability to attain what you poured. You're wasting your oil. It's time to go. It's time to go. When your season is up, it's time to go, men and women of God. We look at Ecclesiastes chapter three, one through eight, and it says, for everything there is a season and a time for every, every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up. What is planted? A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Somebody better get this. A time to cast away stone and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to loose. A time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. When we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it was written by King Solomon towards the end of his reign. And contained within this book is many different um, types of poetry of wisdom in this book. When we begin to understand that there was much wisdom um, in the completeness of the Hebrew poetry collection within the word of God that King Solomon had written. And we need to understand that the familiarity of the word of God offers a comforting reminder of God's very sovereignty for his people. We need to understand that it's time to go. Don't stay there. Don't get stuck. Mm -hmm. 
Don't let your comfort zone become your crib. And mm -hmm. don't spiritually die, people of God. God has got too much purpose. And he's got so much he's promised you over your life. You've stepped out of the boat. Now walk in your purpose. Mm -hmm. You've stepped out of the boat. Now walk in your purpose. It's going to take much prayer. It's going to take much surrender. It's going to take a total surrender to God. That's what these pictures are about on this slide. Stand in your comfort zone. What calls it to become your crypt? It's time to shift and it's time to go. We're going to close with this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9 through 10, moving out of your comfort zone. Everybody has a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. There is a certain temperature at which we feel the most comfortable. There is a way of life in which we feel at ease. There is a crowd of people with whom we feel most comfortable. Huh. When we are around the wrong crowd, in the wrong situation, in the wrong place, and doing the wrong things, we can feel very uncomfortable and out of place. When we find ourselves outside of our comfort zone, we can become a little nervous. And there is nothing wrong with that, men and women of God. It just proves that we are interested in being comfortable that we're not comfortable. And so we're, we're, we're being uncomfortable in a place that is unfamiliar. We've lost that familiarity. And so when you step outside your comfort zone, you lose what has been comfortable, what has been familiar, what you've known, what you've seen, what you understand, what you comprehend. But then when you step outside the boat, out of that comfort zone to live and to live abundantly, spiritually, then you understand that, you know what? It's going to cause some growth. It's going to cause some stretching. It's going to cause some pruning. It's going to cost me something. You got to understand to step outside your comfort zone, you're going to have to shed some blood. My God. Mm -hmm. There is a sense of being comfortable that can become a very thing of concern when we get too comfortable in a situation. It is easy to reach a place as an individual when we become satisfied with the very status quo. <clears throat> we so structure our lives to a point that we can almost predict what will happen from one day to the next day, from one moment to the next moment. For many, this very type of stability provides a deep sense of security and well-being, and there is nothing wrong with that. However, it has become your comfort zone. And if you stay there, it will become your crew. It is when this same type of comfortable living invades our spiritual life that causes us to be in trouble, that causes us to begin to spiritually die. Mm. We become complacent about prayer. We become immobile. We become comfortable. Uh, we get into a place that we're not praying like we used to. We're not fasting like we used to. Uh, uh, we're not advancing spiritually and progressing like we used to. Uh, our comfort zone has stagnated us spiritually. But we need to get back to the place that we're not just satisfied with the status quo. If you have ever, as a Christian, as a child of God, reached a place where you could just be satisfied spiritually, where you don't desire to grow more in the things of God, then I would say you are on your way to spiritually die. And we pray that you do not allow yourself to stay there and to die. Not only do many individuals live in a spiritual comfort zone, but so do many churches. When the attendance is up and the offerings are good, we may be tempted to back off and to take it easy, to not bring the correction, to not bring the reproof, to not sit people down, to not bring people into counsel, to not say, you know what, you're going to have to sit for a season. You know what, um, the Lord has been dealing with me. We need to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Huh. Afraid that you're going to offend somebody. Leaders, it's time to grow up, it's time to get a spine. It's time to have a backbone. It's time to preach 
the unadulterated word of God. It's time to stop pacifying these demons. It's time to stop dragging alone and resuscitate the same people over and over. And when there are prodigal sons and daughters, people in the highways and hedges that are dying and that are waiting and listening for your sound. Many times as children of God, we may not pray for the churches or a church the way that we should. We may not invite others to a church. We may not connect with people outside of the church. We may walk past the sinner man and not even try to encourage them. We are not moving outside of our comfort zone when we do these things. So Apostle Herbie and I have come to say to you, are you stuck in your comfort zone? in a place of complacency? Have you gotten to a place that you're not moving outside of a building of four walls of where God has called you to be? And you know what? It's nothing wrong with going to the church, but the word of God tells us that we are the church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when we show up to a building, that the word of God tells us the building is to assemble ourselves together, to come together, to come in unity to come there and worship, to build one another up, my God, to worship, to lift up a joyful sound to the heaven as a unified body. But ask yourself, when I leave the building, am I still the church? That's good right there. Amen. Amen. When I leave the building and people see me on my job, outside my home, in the stores, when I'm up and down doing whatever I may be doing in this natural world, do they still know me and they still recognize that I am a child of the king? Don't let your comfort zone become your crypt. Amen. Apostle Herbie and I want to thank each and every last one of you for getting on here today and just for listening to this word for being a part of what God is doing in this hour and in this season. And you know what? I, I've gotten to a place, I'm gonna tell y'all something. I love people, I do, I do, I love people. Anybody who knows me know I love people. I have the agape love of Jesus Christ permeating through my entire being. But the one thing I will not do, I will not compromise the gospel. And I will not compromise my walk with God for anybody. Even though I love them, many times I have to leave them. And it doesn't mean I have an issue with them, but it means I desire God more than anything else. I desire God more than my next breath. I desire that God be pleased with me, men and women of God. That's where I am. That's where I want to hear God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. Come on in. Amen. I refuse to be like Moses, to like he told with the Israelites. The word of God tells us that they were a bunch of stiff and, and, and uh, stiff-necked people. They were stubborn. They were set in their ways. They were unrelenting. They were unyielding. They were unsubmitted after God had did all of these things. And Moses allowed these people to get him so frustrated that the Lord told him to touch the rock with the rod, and he struck the rock to bring the water for him. And he sinned because it was disobedience what he did. And it is an awful thing. He had carried these people 40 years in the wilderness. And Moses, because of that one thing he had done, he couldn't enter into the promised land. All he could do was go up on the mountain and look over. The Lord allowed him to look over into the promise. But he let him know that you will not be going with them. For Joseph will fulfill this purpose and Joseph will be your successor to take them in to the promised land. Men and women of God, do not allow man to get you so angry, so frustrated, so aggravated that you serve God all your life and you miss walking into the purpose of your promise. My God. Apostle Herbie, I'm going to turn it over to you. That's it. You got anything you want to say? That's it. You That's sure? it. Mm -hmm. On our slides, you will see we've got our 
uh, ministries email address, our websites, as well as a phone number here, which is 352-325-5925. You're able to call that. You're able to text that. Um, allow us 24 to 48 hours. Our admin, ad administrative team will get back to you. You're also able, running across the bottom of the screen, you're able to go to our website. We have two different ones, which is rcnministries.com or osgaglobal.com. That is our apostolic network. That is uh, another um, branch of our ministries through RCN Ministries. We have our global TV here, RCN Ministries, um, global TV on our YouTube channel. We also have our other YouTube channel, which is the oldest, Apostle Rosemary, RCN Ministries, and OSGA. That is also on here. Subscribe, hit your alert, your notification bell, so you'll know when we go live because um, we're, we're streaming to both. But eventually, I'm going to break off and do some different things with the primary channel we've had other than this one. Um, you can also catch us on Let's Talk About It podcast. Um, that is on every platform, Apple, um, Spotify, what, you name it, it's there. It's even on Google. Um, if you want to just get a chance, get on and also follow us there. You'll be able to hear our weekly podcast, which is on Wednesdays. And we're dealing with some some of the issues that the church considers taboo. We're, we're not leaving any stone unturned. And we thank God that it is ranking in the top 40 um, globally, but especially in the continent of Africa. And so we are so blessed that we're able to utilize these tools for the kingdom and be able to reach the nations globally for the gospel and for, for Jesus Christ. So we thank you all for coming. We thank you all for tuning in. We pray that this has been a blessing for you. If you want to sow or give, you can go to our website there and give, which is our RCN Ministries online giving. You can visit RCN Ministries and you can click on there. You've got all the tiles you can give online. You can also text to give. Our text to give is 844-961-4333. You can also give um, through our text to give as well. Um, and we're also on Cash App. You can go to Cash App. Um, I think it's dollar sign A-R-C-N-M. Let me look. I forget what Cash App is, y'all. We got PayPal. We got we got it all, y'all. Hold on. I got to look because I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, it's dollar sign A R C N Men M I N. So it's dollar sign A R C N M I N. That's our cash app. Um, and we're also on PayPal. You can find us on PayPal, um, which is Rosemary Collins Neverson Ministries, abbreviated R C N Ministries. So um, if the Lord um quickens you to so at any time to give, just always know you can always go to our platform on our website. You can always text to give and be a blessing um, to help us continue the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ globally um, to impact people in regions, territories, um, and just be a blessing to the people of God. Amen. Amen. Again, I'm going to say Apostle told me I'm long winded. Anything else, Apostle Herbie? Don't let your comfort zone become your crib. That's it. That's it. He said, that's it. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. May God bless you. May God keep you until next week. And here comes our commercial.